Win big in 2024 with Team Sync from Roto Baller. Import your fantasy teams and sync your leagues. Get customized tools and tailored advice for your specific rosters and scoring settings, including live recommendations from the Live Draft Assistant, Free Agent Finder, and Lineup Optimizer. Sync an unlimited amount of NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL fantasy teams from all of the major fantasy platforms. Get a discount for any premium pass using my promo code Knuckler. Just visit rotoballer.com slash radio and start rotoballing like a boss. And we got fantasy football season right around the corner, basketball and hockey right after that. So it makes a great gift for the fantasy partaker in your life. This podcast is also brought to you by Parlay Play Fantasy Sports. Use my referral code ROTOBRADY. Get that sweet, sweet deposit bonus. They got free contests, paid contests coming to a state near you. They're giving out boosts and slashing lines and bonuses, uh, specials all day long. Check it out. It's a really fun player prop DFS platform. And what is up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you another. It, this is Brady Grove bringing you episode 146 of Roto Baller's official MMA podcast. Tap that. We got UFC Vegas 95 this weekend. Break out the red panties. Uh, so we got Invicta on Friday on CBS Sports Network. There's so, It's a light week in MMA, even on UFC Fight Pass. I don't even think there's like anything going on. Uh, it, and then it heats up next week when we got the Contender Series back. There's PFL. So for my picks on all major combat sports events, boxing, MMA, stuff on UFC Fight Pass, regional promotions, follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. That's where I make picks for all that stuff. Follow the podcast. Like, subscribe, leave favorable comments and reviews. Tell your friends. That's it. Tap that MMA podcast on Facebook, YouTube, and Spotify. The card kicks off this Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern. I will be in the Roto Baller MMA Discord throughout Saturday. Come out. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk DFS and sports betting for UFC Vegas 95. We got other interlude episodes coming up uh, that are planned with some folks from the Arena Football League, guys that are uh, currently looking for homes in professional football. Going to be excited to have those conversations. And, uh, and another MMA fighter who shall remain nameless until, uh, until we put that episode out. But that's going to be a fun one, too. So look out for those and check out my MMA DFS Value Picks article coming out on Fridays now. So, last week... Uh, it was not a great week. You know, my my faith in Corey Sanhagen as a heavy dog did not work out. Char the Bullet got the win, just not by knockout. Figgy, Divas and Figueredo beats Cheeto Vera. Michael Chiesa d- did quick work on Tony Ferguson. Um, you know, the Dern and Lupita fight, yeah, I... Joel Alvarez came back in spectacular fashion again. Alonzo Minifield got knocked out. That's a you know that's two straight tough losses for him. Um, Shamil got a win, a much needed one against Dante Mays, but like you know did not look spectacular. Looked dominant, but not spectacular. Jordan Vucinich started off super hot and then waned as the fight went on, and Gurham ends up coming back, landing the bigger shots, and getting that unanimous decision. Victoria Dudakova really let it go against Sam Hughes and still almost won by split decision. That was a rough loss for her, uh, but a great win for Sam Hughes. Cedricus Dumas gets another win. Um, so it was a weird week last week. It's going to be another weird one this week for sure. So we're hoping to capitalize on that and turn some weirdness around for UFC Vegas 95. Folks, we currently only have uh, 10 fights on this card. That's, I, I assume why it's currently starting at 5 p.m. That, that could even move back. We've had plenty of fights canceled. Alan Nascimento and Jaffa Fio, Uros Medic and Danny Barlow. Danny Barlow has a replacement fight now. We were supposed to get Johnny Parson, Parsons and Yusaka Kinoshita. And Chris Gutierrez was supposed to fight Javi Basharat before Basharat withdrew. They have found a replacement for him. But we start off with a straw weight matchup between Stephanie Luciano and Talita Alansar. Alansar. Um, oh, we do have EFC this weekend, or this week. That is important. That is actually tomorrow. Maybe I should make some picks for that. You have Brave CF, too? Damn. All right. I am going to have to make picks for those. That's important. Anyway, um, 
on to Luciano and Alan Star. Uh, uh, Luciano is the minus one sixty six favorite. Alan Star the plus one forty underdog. Let's start with Talita. Come on, you know what? We'll start with Luciano uh, since that's not loading. Five one and one is a pro, twenty four years old, currently ranked number eighty five in the world at straw weight. Three wins by decision, two by knockout um, on the contender series. This is where they had their draw. Um, you know, with each other back in September of last year. They're doing it for real this time on uh, on uh, the UFC Vegas event. So, you know, that draw, Luciano outstruck her 87 to 35. Alan Sar got that draw, you know, with four takedowns to one. Uh, it ended up being... Good Lord, UFC stats is taking a long time to load today. But, you know... It, Luciano's most recent wins before that was November of 2022 in Jungle Fight 112. You know, she had been with Jungle Fight a couple fights in a row. She does have a split decision win over Michelle Oliveira uh, in LFA, which is always meaningful. Um, so it ended up being 28-28 on all three judges' scorecards in that fight. So, and what was it? Um... What was it that ended up being a 10? Uh, um, okay, just looked it up, uh, and it was a 10-8 a round by Luciano in the third round when she was losing and, and ended up getting a draw out of it, which is impressive. Um, but, you know, Toledo was the one who won the first two rounds in that one. And Toledo since then has beaten Ryan Dos Santos by split decision. She got outstruck 57 to 36 there, too. But all she one takedown was, was all it took in addition to 36 strikes for Talita Alansar. You know, that is some... That's that's two very, very close outcomes for your first two uh, experiences in the UFC. Talita Alansar, she is, you know... There's been more consistency. Um, Luciano... <laughs> You know, it was Alan Sar that had just a more well-rounded attack in that first fight. And you see, like, what her methodology is. She doesn't need to even really... She doesn't need to tie you in the striking. She just needs to do, you know, what she does on the ground and keep it close enough and control you. That that has already been the path to a decent amount of success so far uh, and at least no losing efforts. So here, when Luciana did need a 10-8 round in round three to get that draw it seems crazy that she's the minus 166 favorite and it makes sense she's the one who ended on the better note luciana by tko knockout that's plus 450 i think that kind of makes sense here if she's making adjustments to to uh, negate talita's game plan but i don't know i I think that talita being plus 140 i think that this is still like their first fight was a draw by that same margin you know you can't depend on a 10-8 round three every time so it just seems like this fight has to be a coin flip and Talita is the one with the the more experience really at this level so 50 50 matchup give me Talita plus 140 hit it oh! and for Talita um I'm going by decision plus 215 I think that's the best way to go Luciano I think you know decision Sure, that's plus 120, but by TKO knockout plus 450, I think is, is maybe where you're getting the better value considering how she finished that last fight, her, their last fight. Next up, we got a featherweight matchup between Yusuf Zalel and Jarno Ahrens. Ahrens, the plus 350 underdog. Zalel, the minus 455 favorite. Let's start off with Jarno Ahrens. I was not a big fan of him after those first two. Okay, soundboard issue there, but Jarno Ahrens. I was not a huge fan of him after those first two UFC fights. Uh, lost by unanimous decision, granted to William Gomi and Song Wu Choi. Not not a bad slew of guys, and he got a knockdown against Song Wu Choi. Uh, he wasn't, com- you know, he, he did get outclassed by William Gomi, but he was not completely defenseless against Song Wu Choi. And then next, March of this year, he comes back with a unanimous decision win, a really good one against Stephen Wynn. Uh, outstriking him 105 to 63. He did get taken down once, but he got a knockdown. That's two knockdowns in his last two fights, and only one win. Uh, so, Jarno, things have been looking up.
for the Frenchman, born in 1994. Uh, that was a nice fight his last time out and caught a lot of people by surprise. Yusuf Zaleo, all right? He had not won in the UFC since August of 2020. He had three straight wins in the UFC, starting off his UFC tenure, all in 2020. Then he lost three in a row to Ilya Tapuria. Understandable. Sung Woo Choi, and he did have a more competitive fight with Choi, you know, I suppose than, maybe than Jarno Aarons did. He didn't knock Choi down or anything. Uh, he did land three takedowns and kept it 41-23 in the striking. Lost to Sean Woodson by split decision in a fight that plenty of people thought he won. And then he had a draw with Damon Blackshear, my majority decision, August of 2022. Um... And I think that that was because of a 10 8 2 um, by Damone Blackshear, I think. I mean, by one of them. Um, I remember that fight. Now, of all things, this dude's coming off a March 2024 win from the Rebus versus Ro- Thug Rose fight night against Billy Quarantillo, getting in with a second round rear naked choke. Um, yeah, look, like. You have Zaleo. Like what Jarno Aarons did in his last fight was good. And, and Stephen Wynn, you know, the, even though that's a guy that is, I, I guess, really of prospect status. Um, and, but it, it was a good win. Yeah, and, and now, you know, we're just talking about Yusuf Zaleo, who, and Stephen Wynn, by the way, three contender series fights. Uh, that's where he was at for so long. Yusuf Zaleo, it's just been a different quality of opponent that he's been fighting. You know, you can compare the Song Wu Choi results, but you also had to fight Damon Blackshear, Sean Woodson, Ilya Taporia. That was after three straight wins that were not that long ago, just four years ago. And now you're coming off a win against Billy Q this year, uh, a, a guy who only fights tough fighters and, and only puts up tough performances. I don't know exactly, like, I don't know if he subs Jarno Aaron's, um, I think John Aarons is going to try to make the fight chaotic, and I think that that's, you know, that's a great suit for him. And I could see, like, if you're going Jarno, plus 350, ah, like, I, I think Yusuf Zalel probably wins this fight, I don't know, like 75, 80 times out of 100. So maybe plus 350 is, um, you know, is a little wild for him. Aarons by TKO knockout, plus 1,500. Aaron's by decision, plus 500. Yeah, that's the most logical there. You, you know, knock someone down, but not necessarily knock them out. Um, Zaleo, by decision, you know, he got the submission over Billy Q. I, I think that, like, you know, he's going to work to try to keep Jarno at a di- and keep Jarno from making it too crazy. I think that this will be a mixed martial arts fight for Yusuf Zaleo. I think he's well-rounded enough um, to dispatch a Jarno Aarons comfortably in three rounds. I'm going Yusuf Zaleo by decision, minus 130, hit it. Ow! And I have really yet to identify anybody out of those four that I am thinking too hard about in DFS. But you don't have a ton of choices this week. There's only 10 fights. And next up, you're going to want a piece of this one. We got a heavyweight matchup between Carl Williams and Jonata Denise. Former professional kickboxer, high-level professional kickboxer, Janata Denise. Um, let's talk about him first. 7-0 and as a professional. He is the plus 180 underdog. Williams is the minus 218 favorite. Denise is 33 years old. All seven professional wins by knockout. Um, let's see. Let's see if he ever fought. No. Seeing what some of the more famous names he's fought in kickboxing. And it's, you know, no one significant at least like majorly significant in the world of MMA but he was a professional kickboxer and did a lot of winning um and it translates to MMA you know he's only been finishing people by knockout that includes a contender series knockout of Eduardo Neves and a um a win in April of this year April 27th over Austin Lane at UFC Fight Night uh Fight Night though which one was it Nicolau versus Perez. Um, a first-round knockout, a second-round knockout. He's only had to land 45 strikes, and he has landed three knockdowns in that stretch of two fights. Born in 1991 with a 79-inch reach. Born in 1990 with a 79-inch reach is the favorite Carl Williams, 
who, by contrast, has won all four of his UFC fights by unanimous decision, a combined 19 takedowns across four fights. He's only ever, ever had to land 70 strikes. He has one knockdown against Lucas Breski. His minimum is 24 strikes, 24, 38, 40, and 70. He's, and that was against Chase Sherman, and, and that's just because it forced that situation. Well, he went ahead and took down Breski and Junior uh, Justin Taffa a combined 15 times. So there's an easy, like, you know, this is quite a style contrast. Williams is 10-1 and one as a pro. His only loss is by submission back in B2 fighting series in 2021. He's gotten a lot of activity, really, in uh, over the last couple of years, uh, which is always, you love to see it from a heavyweight. But, you know, wins over Jimmy Lawson, too, and, and Justin Taffa is probably the best one. Yonata Denise is, you know, still coming off of that entry-level win against Austin Lane. Look, I can probably make a really good case to use either of these guys in DFS, all right? Stylistically, if Williams is going to be on the feet for any time with Yonata Denise, he's going to be in danger uh, of, you know, getting hit and getting caught by a professional kickboxer who has finished every professional MMA fight by knockout. So, Denise plus 180, all right, and that started off at plus 200 and worked its way a little bit down. Denise by TKO knockout, that's plus 300. Hit that all day. That, I, at least, maybe not hit it all day, but that's the best value, value that there is for Denise. That's how you go. And if you're going Carl Williams, um, it, because I do think Carl Williams, more battle tested in the UFC, if it's kickboxing versus a guy that is just really good at getting people down and holding them there and, and, you know, landing his strikes from the ground, then I give that the edge because it's way harder to neutralize. The, because the way you neutralize someone's kickboxing, if you're a really good wrestler and you're good at doing that, is, is taking them down. And, you know, you can't use your kickbox. It, it seems harder sometimes, depending on skill disparity, to use your kickboxing to wield off the takedown as opposed to vice versa. And Carl Williams has shown that he can do that against UFC-level heavyweights consistently. Um, <laughs> he does have some TKOs and knockouts in his past. But, I don't know. I, I think, um, you know, I think he's going to at least have to approach this fight with a little bit of caution because of Denise's background. So, you know, if you're going Denise, you go by knockout, plus 300. And if you're going Carl Williams, go by decision. That's plus 195. Williams by TKO, that's plus 190. Or like by sub, um, that's plus 1,000. That's always a possibility just if Denise gets tired. But I don't know. Williams by decision, it's hard to fade that at this point. Plus 195. I think Williams probably wins this fight like 65 to 70 times out of 100. But it would be very... Either way, like these are guys that we're looking to, to be like some glimmer of hope and... And, you know, excitement in the heavyweight division. It's kind of a shame that they're fighting each other, honestly, because I'd like to see, you know, at a certain point, you can only beat so many entry to, you know, mid-level guys before you kind of have to face each other and see who's the better of the two. Um, and, it, you know, it's kind of gotten accelerated for Denise a little bit, it, which is cool. So, because um, was that always going to be the fight? Yeah, it was. There, there wasn't a difference. So... Yeah, I, I think that I'm really excited to see who wins that one. I'm going to be excited either way. Um, Carl, you know, <laughs> Carl Williams might be, you know, um, criticized by plenty for his fighting style, but at least, you know, it's a dude who isn't, you know, isn't 40 years old, and he's fighting frequently, and he's winning a lot, and, and you know, it, it's at least something to watch out for in the heavyweight division. Next up, we've got, a women's bantamweight matchup between Carol Rosa and Pani Kianzad. Kianzad is the plus 180 underdog. Carol Rosa, the minus 218 favorite. Carol Rosa was the minus 155 favorite. There's been a lot of movement on that. Let's start off with Carol Rosa. All right. So she started off her UFC tenure with four straight wins. All of her fights have gone to decision. Her losses are to Sarah McMahon who took her down four times. Norma Dumont, even though she knocked her down, but she got out truck 35 to 33, taken down once in that fight, April of 2023. She's coming off a unanimous decision loss to Irene Aldana. Uh, she outstruck her 204 to 145. Um, but that, and you know, that was at UFC 296. That ended up 29-28 on all three judges' scorecards. Her best wins, 
you know, landed 120 strikes and two takedowns on Vanessa Mello. She got 171 strikes against Laura Pachopio. Lena Landsberg, 54 strikes and three takedowns, survived a knockdown, uh, and then a split decision against Yana Santos, July 2023. That's probably, her Lena is probably the biggest name that Carol Rosa has beaten, but these decisions kind of end up getting closer and closer. You know, when you land 204 strikes and you lose, there is a problem with your round-by-round effectiveness. Now, I like Carol Rosa in DFS because I think this is a close fight and she's always been able to land high-volume strikes. Uh, So I think there is value there. But I tend to agree with my dude Cody over there at Blood Money MMA Bets uh, in his analysis on this. This is going to be a close fight. This is probably going to be a close decision. Um, And so it's crazy in that circumstance to have a minus 218 favorite in what is a, a, a well you know, matched fight. So Panic Yonza, she won four fights in a row uh, back in November 2019 to June of 2021 over Jessica Rose Clark, Beth Correa, Sajara Eubanks, and Alexis Davis. Now, she has only won one fight in her last four since September of 2021. But that loss, those losses came to Raquel Pennington, Kellen Vieira, and Macy Chieson for the second time. She has a win against Lena Landsberg, April of 2022, by unanimous decision, outstriking her 78 to 39 with one takedown, and she survived a knockdown in that one. So, if you were going to compare the, you know, performances against Landsberg, it looks much more comparable than the odds currently have it as. Now, that's not how any of this works. We know that she had a really good fight, you know, with Raquel Pennington. It, it kept it, you know, statistically close. And I'm looking for the scorecards. 29-28 on all three judges' scorecards against Raquel Pennington. So, you know, she's lost three of her last four, but this is about a 50-50 matchup. You know, if Carol Rosa is going to try to play this game with Penny Kianza, and, you know, it's 95-66 to 66 in the striking, maybe you each get a takedown, maybe one of you lands the harder strikes, I'm not even necessarily picking a winner here. I think both of these two are decent for DFS, and I think that they'll probably be priced fair. I think Penny will be obviously at a at a better price, um, but I think this is fifty fifty. The, the resume wise, I think they line up very evenly. Statistically, they wind up you know they line up very evenly. Um, and Carol Rosa, you know, uh, credit for what you did against Irene Aldana, and you know who has looked great over her last four fights, with the only loss being to Amanda Nunes, but. You know, that's the one that she would kind of have to hang her hat on. And, um, you know, that was 29-28 on all three when, when she fought when she fought Irene Aldana. So, yeah, I think based on all that, you just can't have someone minus 218 here. Panny, by decision, by the way, fight to go the distance, minus 450. And honestly, I think that that is conservative. So throw, put that in a parlay, you know, plus 450 for this fight to go to decision. It's like 95% of these two fighters over the course of the UFC careers have gone to decision and they could have lost a lot of those. So go with the underdog here. Plus 180, Penikianza, Kianza by decision, plus 240, um, Rosa by decision, minus 145. God, you're getting a better value with Penny here. Uh, but I, you know, I think you go by decision for either of them. And I, I think you just have to roll with the underdog in a fight that is so much closer than these odds have it. Next up, we got a bantamweight matchup between Toshiomi Kazama and Shara Lampos Gregorio. Rig or you. Yeah, Gregorio. Gregorio is the minus 258 favorite. Kazama, the plus 210 underdog. Let's start off with... Shara Lampos. What country is he from, too? We're going to find out. Cyprus. Love to see that. Very, and love to see uh, little represented countries in here. So he won by first round knockout on the Contender Series August of last year against Cameron Smotherman. He is coming off of a unanimous decision loss March of this year to Chad and Helliger, a UFC fight night to Ivasa versus Tybura. That was 29-28 on two of the judges' scorecards, 30-27 on Derek Cleary's uh, against Ann Hellinger. So, respectable performance. He got out of truck 85-21. He did land four takedowns. He was born in 1992. 
Uh, Kazama, 69-inch reach, will have a 2-inch reach advantage. He was born in 1997. Professionally, he is 10-4, and four, one on road to UFC. When you, you know, back in June of 2022, by unanimous decision, didn't take a lot, 25 strikes, two takedowns uh, against Maya, Maya, Maya Ichihoeti, Kara Muali. Who? Now, he is coming off two straight losses. This is a problem. Against Rinya Nakamura, by first round knockout February of last year. Uh, now, Rinya, he's 3 and 0 at the UFC level, counting the Kazama win, but still, he's beaten Fernie Garcia and Carlos Vera since then. Uh, and then he got knocked out in the first round by Garrett Armfield, August of last year. Garrett Armfield, very respectable fighter, for sure. Um, you know, here's the trouble. Like, you guys know I love Japanese fighters. Kazama is a young dude. Uh, that I, I think if he hangs around at the UFC level is going to get better. And, you know, to take on a guy like Garrett Armfield is, and, you know, having to, after a knockout loss to Rinya Nakamura where you got knocked down twice, that is ballsy, respect. Um, and I think that this guy, you know, still has upward trajectory. But when your only win coming into this fight is your, you know, road to UFC win, against a dude who's 26 and 11 as a professional, nicknamed the Keurig Mountain Eagle, which is pretty sick. That just gives me way too much pause uh, when your only win coming into this is Road to UFC. This started off at minus 218 for Charlampos and has worked its way up to minus 258. I think you got to go with the guy that put up a respectable scorecard against Chan L. Hedger, uh, and Hedger, who is now... Pretty much three and two in the UFC, counting the contender series um, with a win over Jesse Strader. Uh, you know, pretty pretty decent resume there. And Charlampos with that first round knockout over Cameron Smotherman. Toshiomi is not going to want to come incorrect here uh, because you will end up getting finished the same way that you did against Garrett Armfield and Rinya Nakamura. I am rooting for you, Toshiyama Kazama. I am. But when your last win is road to UFC two years ago. Don't do this. You cannot do this, you know? I hope you win, but Gregorio, minus 258. I think he wins this fight probably 80 to 85 times out of 100. Maybe a hard 80. I think the number is appropriate. To make it worthwhile, Gregorio, by TKO knockout, minus 110, hit it. Ow! And Kazama, I'd probably just have to, like, plus 210 is fine. If you want to go... Kazama by decision plus seven hundred make it real juicy. I won't blame you there. Um, I, again, I'm rooting for Kazama, but I I can also root for the guy from Cyprus. That's interesting too. Next up, we got a women's bantamweight matchup between Yana Santos and Chelsea Chandler. Yana Santos, the minus one forty eight favorite. Chelsea Chandler, the plus one twenty four underdog. Let's talk about Yana Santos first. It's so crazy, like, that Yana Santos hasn't had the activity level and the consistency in wins that, in my head, I have always imagined her having. She's got four UFC wins in nine fights. Um, now sitting professionally at 14 and 8, 14, 8 and 1, born in 1989. Her last win was February of 2021 against Ketlin Vieira, outstriking her 47 to 7, getting taken down three times. And, you know, this is what I love about Yana Santos. This is why I think she has a chance to beat a lot of fighters in these spots, and Chelsea Chandler could be within that range, is she just does this thing where the way that she fights, whether she takes you down or not, it just completely shuts down your offense. It's not like Julia Stoliarenko has a ton of that in the striking department to begin with, but when you win two fights in a row by unanimous decision with only one takedown, a combined 91 strikes, and you only allow a combined 13 strikes from your opponent. That's crazy. Uh, she got knocked out by Aspen Ladd. Um, she got, you know, knocked out in her UFC debut, naturally UFC 20, 222 against uh, Cyborg. She's on a three-fight losing streak right now. A knockout loss to Irene Aldana and two straight decision losses to Holly Holm and to Carol Rosa. And what was a close fight with Carol Rosa that a lot of people thought Yana Santos won. Chelsea Chandler, born in 1990. Winner of two of three at the UFC level. A knockout against Julia Stoliarenko. 
and a unanimous decision win over Josiah Nunes, 58-47 in the striking, two takedowns for Chandler. Her only loss is by unanimous decision to Norma Dumont, July of last year. Um, yeah, you know, this is kind of a reverse spot from what I was expecting. You know, I was kind of expecting Chandler to be the favorite here. Um, did it start that way? Yeah, Chandler was minus 115 when this line dropped. So I was expecting Chandler to be the favorite. And in that spot is usually where I would like Giannis Santos as a plus 124 underdog for the exact traits that I just mentioned. But you're making Chelsea Chandler the underdog at plus 124. This seems like a trap spot for me. This seems like a spot where I'd say, yeah, Giannis Santos has been a long, you know, over three years since she's won. But, you know, maybe you should have beaten Carol Rosa. And, you know, the competition's been tougher. She's been in the UFC, you know, for a good amount of years, just not necessarily super consistent activity. Chelsea Chandler isn't that much younger, but the, you know, two of her three UFC wins have been really impressive. And then Norma Dumont, her only UFC loss by unanimous decision, was she's riding a four or five winning streak and has won seven of her last eight, with the only loss being a Macy Chieson. Wins against Felicia Spencer, Aspen Ladd, Carol Rosa, uh, and Jermaine de Rondemey. All in that stretch. The loss to Norma Dumont tells me that Chelsea Chandler, you know, can compete with the likes of Giannis Santos. In fact, I think now people are kind of sleeping on her. I think Chelsea Chandler seems a little bit harder to slow down the activity of. You know, if Holly Holm at her age, you're able to get Yana down four times and outstrike her 32 to 21. I think Chelsea Chandler can at least do that with a couple of takedowns. Maybe it ends up being a split decision. I don't think she knocks out Yana Santos. That's a hard thing to do. Irene Aldana, Aspen Ladd, and, and Cyborg were the ones who had to do that, and I haven't necessarily seen that from Chelsea Chandler. But that win against Josiah Nunes, the Stoli Rinka win, the fashion that she did it in, and then how she looked against Norma Dumont, even though she lost, um, Norma is, you know, a really good opponent to get you ready for the likes of Yana Santos. Her offense is ha- going to have to be going. You know, you cannot get stuck in the quicksand with Yana Santos because she'll drag you right down into it. But I think Chelsea Chandler wins this fight 55 times out of 100. It, it might be closer to 50-50 again, but in that instance, you know, Chelsea Chandler plus 124, it feels like a situation where I go, ah, this is where Yana breaks the losing streak. But here comes Chelsea Chandler just quietly, you know, we didn't even know. But here she is. So, Chelsea Chandler. Nick, one comment, man, one comment. No, don't be scared, homie. Fight goes to decision here, minus 295. I think, if you know, the more likely the two to get an inside-the-distance victory, Chandler maybe by TKO knockout, plus 700. But really, like, Yana by decision, minus 110. Chandler by decision, plus 250. Those are solid values. Chandler by decision, I think, plus 250. That's nice. Uh, DFS-wise, if I'm going with anybody, I'm going with Chandler. Yana's not going to be a high scorer, but we'll see if she's, like, really cheap. But I don't think she will be as the minus 148 favorite. Interesting. Um, and she, oh, where is that one? I feel like I'm skipping one or something. Oh, yeah. Th- that's what that is. Uh yeah, Cheppy in the coming event. Okay, gotcha. So, next up, we've got a bantamweight matchup in what was going to be the coming event with Chris Gutierrez. He is no longer fighting Javid, or wait, Fareed, Javid Basharat. He is fighting Kwong Lee. Kwong Bang Lee, I believe, is that man's nickname. Lay is the plus 400 underdog. Gutierrez, the minus 535 favorite. That seems overwhelmingly fair. But let's talk about Lay, the 8-0 and professional out of Vietnam. 32 years old, ranked as the number 113 Bantamweight in the world, according to Tapology. Two knockouts, three submissions, three by decision. What I love about Lay is out of eight of his professional fights, seven of them were with LFA. The last three opponents were re- had records of six and three, six and one, and six and three. Solid, you know that that's um, you know it's not uh L- an LFA champion kind of thing, but LFA is about as reputable as a regional or a feeder promotion as there is. So 
you know, spending so much time there. I, I like what that must do to an up and coming fighter's DNA, for lack of a better term. But Chris Gutierrez. Come on. Gutierrez. All right. Winner of five of his last seven fights. And really, the only thing breaking that, you know, August 2020, he had a draw with Cody Durden. He had won three fights in a row before that. This guy's only losses in the UFC are to Rayoni Barcelos, Pedro Munoz in April of 2023, and Song Yedong. That was his last fight, December of last year. He outstruck Yedong 87 to 77, got taken down twice, um, and ended up... Come on. Come on. Ended up losing the fight 50 to 45 and, and even 50 to 44 on, on one of the judges' scorecards. Uh, it, it's just crazy when you look at the statistics of that. Uh, but, you know, you, uh, the volume of Gutierrez, it was just not the same as the, the power that Song Yudong was packing with each of his strikes. Gutierrez's wins in that time. Two decisions over Andre Yule and Felipe, uh, former tap that guest, Andre Yule. Felipe Coleras, Dana Bajarao with a second round knockout. Knocked out Frankie Edgar. And then a unanimous decision win where he landed 110 strikes against Alatang uh, Alatang Ali. There we go. So, you know, here's the thing. It's a different level here. You know, Lay, I am going to be very excited to watch him fight. Uh, This is a great opportunity for him, especially at 32. Undefeated as a pro, cool nickname, coming out of Vietnam. He's a big underdog. That is not enough for me to like him here uh, against El Guapo. Coming in as a late replacement, Gutierrez, you know, as long as he keeps his head and treats this like the fight that he was going to have in the first place, this guy's done very little losing over the last five years in the UFC it, with some great names that he's gotten wins over, and you've had to be a really, really good bantamweight over the last five years to get a win over Chris Gutierrez. Um, you know, most of these wins are by decision. I think that it's possible that, like, you know, you could go psychological with this and try to figure out, like, well, what is, you know, is Gutierrez going to take it a little bit easier because he doesn't know the guy as well? And, you know, this ends up being a decision. Or, you know, is this guy just a little bit too green to face a guy as tough as Chris Gutierrez and it ends up being a knockout? Those prop odds are not out yet on best fight odds. I think that the value of them is kind of split because you're just kind of talking about psychological stuff there, and it could go either way. Gutierrez minus 535, like, I don't think that that's necessarily worth... Like, I don't think there's a ton super worth betting in this fight. Uh, Other than, like, Gutierrez by decision or Gutierrez by knockout, if it's a good enough number, I think Gutierrez is a really obvious... You know, one one of the main guys that you're going to be looking at if he's, you know, going to be pretty expensive to work into your lineup on Saturday. Again, Kwong Lei, Bang, Kwong Bang Lee. I'm going to be rooting for you on Saturday. However. Don't do this. You cannot do this, you know. That's a real tough order for your UFC debut. Uh, but it'd be awesome, you know, if he got the win. But this is going to be, th- that's a really tough ask. Gutierrez was, you know, going to be ready to fight in a big spot this weekend. Uh, now he's fighting a guy taking on the toughest test of his life. He's coming off of a loss, so he's going to be looking to respond with a big performance. Um, and if he doesn't knock out Kong Lei, I think he does land triple-digit strikes. Next up, we got a welterweight matchup between Nikolai Veretenikov Veritenik- against Danny... Barlow, Danny Barlow, the minus 380 favorite, Nikolai, the plus 300 underdog. Let's talk about Danny Barlow, left hand to God. Nick, one comment, man, one comment. No, don't be scared, homie. Danny Barlow is, might be the guy that the internet is the most excited to see on Saturday. 29 years old, got a 79-inch reach for welterweight, five professional wins by knockout, one submission, two decisions. His last, you know, four MMA wins have been by knockout, 
he did some combat jiu-jitsu as well in between. That's always cool. Um, was not the Cage Fury champion, crazy, crazily enough, uh, before coming on to the Contender Series. Um, but his last win was against Jarius Gill, July 2023 in Cage Fury. Then he got that first round knocking in the Contender Series against Raheem Forrest and is coming off that uh, round three? Yeah, round three knockout against Josh Keenlon, where he also landed 95 strikes in that time. Uh, so doesn't matter what round, and it doesn't matter whether he breaks his arm. He's always dangerous with that left hand of God. Uh, a lot of knockouts, you know, in his uh, in his amateur career, too. I love Cage Fury. I love what Danny Barlow has been up to so far in the UFC and in the Contender Series. No one should want to fight that guy right now. And enter Nikolai Verit- Veritenikov. 12-4 and four as a pro, coming out of Kazakhstan, 34 years old. He'll be at a 5-inch reach disadvantage. One, uh, nine wins by knockout, one by submission, two by decision. His last loss was by unanimous decision to Michael Morales on the Contender Series, September of 2021. This is a guy that's been in good, you know, organizations as well. He's got a long professional record. Um, did some M1 stuff real early in his career. Was with Fury FC, LFA for a couple, or for a few. Back to Fury. Lost the Contender Series fight. And then, since then, three straight victories, all inside the distance, two knockout and a submission in United Fight League. Most recent being for their welterweight championship, April 27th of this year. He does have one career loss by knockout, in 2014, the Ronnie Landeta, an M1 mix fighter. So, you know, this guy is well battle tested in solid organizations. Um, against Michael Morales, it wasn't that bad of a loss. He, it, it was only, you know, 53 to 52 in the striking for Morales. He just got taken down four times. The problem is, you do not. Want to, you don't want to get hit by Danny Barlow. That's it. Like, I keep coming back to that. I, I can't fade an undefeated professional with a five-inch reach advantage, younger, who is already notched, um, who has already notched two UFC victories, counting the Contender Series, and one being against a respectable opponent like Josh Keenlon. So, you know... What what are the odds on on that? Minus three eighty does seem a little crazy. Um, it was minus two eighty five at first, worked its way up. You know, like Nikolai has enough professional experience at a high level with his only you know recent loss, like like lost in like a decade, is to Michael Morales on the Contender Series. Plus three hundred seems a little nutty. Like I do think that. You know, Nikolai maybe wins this fight like 35, 40 times out of 100, 45 even. You know, like we, we've still seen like a, a limited professional resume for Danny Barlow and, you know, an even more limited professional resume from everybody he beat leading up to his time in the UFC. But here's what we got is, you know, if you're going Nikolai, you don't have to go with the method of victory. And I think he's playable in DFS too for how many inside the distance victories that he's had in his career. Uh, Danny Barlow, if you're swinging wild, you could get caught with the, you know, you could get caught coming in. You know, that's one of the risks that you take. And Nikolai, if he does, you know, hit one of those and land right, then that could be it. Plus 300 seems a little nutty just as a straight up money line play. So I think that that's good. But the bet of this one is Barlow wins by TKO knockout plus 110. Hit it. That's what we're going to all be looking for and hoping for. Uh, but I, I just cannot fade Danny Barlow when he's been, I mean, just terrorizing people on the feet. And, and you know, this is a guy that people want to see succeed. That that left hand alone is very marketable. Um, and, and we've seen him do it at this level. And, and you know, we've seen Nikolai do it at a slightly lower level. But this is a really scary introduction to the UFC level after, you know, your only other one being a unanimous decision loss on the Contender Series. But this is closer than the odds indicate. But the real play here is, like, I think both of them are viable DFS plays. You you know, Danny Barlow is going to be expensive. Nikolai could be a nice sleeper pick there on DraftKings and on FanDuel. 
But the real thing is, like, the prop you got to go with is Danny Barlow, plus 110 to win by knockout. If you're not feeling a method of victory, you know, I, I don't think you throw Danny Barlow in a parlay. I think maybe you sprinkle a little bit on Nikolai on the money line just because, you know, Fury, LFA, only lost being on the Contender Series in a decade. I will give this guy credit. He is not a can. And Danny Barlow is far from being a well-established dude. So that's a lot to talk about that one, but there's a lot to say about that one. And we are on to the co-main event of the evening. It is a featherweight matchup between Chepe Mariscal and Damon Jackson. And was this a... No. I thought that I'd seen some movement. I thought maybe that had been rearranged, but that's just a lot of what happened on this card anyway. To end up with 10 fights that people are like, what the hell? But uh, I'm not impressed by your performance, and I look forward to... Because we'll naturally get to the main event in a minute. But Chepe... Minus 210, the favorite, Damon Jackson, the plus 175 underdog. Let's start off with Damon Jackson. You see stats. Hasn't done this to me in a while, but here we go. Going to keep me from not uh, from going, hitting under the hour mark, and so are things like that that I'm trying to spit out. Damon Jackson, winner of five of his last seven fights in the UFC. Who is this guy lost to in the UFC, and at least recently? He's got three losses since December of 2020. Ilya Taporia, Dan Ige, Billy Quarantillo. Made it exciting, you know, I, I think against uh, Billy Q. He got knocked out by Dan Ige and Elia. Um, but, you know, he got outstruck 167 against Billy Q. He did get three takedowns. You know, so it ended up being competitive. Damon Jackson, you know, beat Charles Rose in that time. Camilla Kirk, Dan Argetta, Pat Sabatini. Very consistent level of competition that he was taking on. It was only, you know, this last fight, April of 2024, that the name value of his wins went up in beating Alexander Hernandez by split decision on striking him 42-32. to 32. Three takedowns. He did get knocked down once and survived it against the, uh, the physically imposing Alexander the Great. Chepe. Come on. There we go. Chepe, the machine gun Mariscal. Born in 1992, so he is four years younger than Damon Jackson. Three straight UFC wins. He's only one in the UFC. Two decisions. One against Trevor Peak in his UFC debut January of last year. I was striking him 71 to 51 with four takedowns. Gave, gave the junkyard dog Trevor Peak the business in that fight. A second round knockout against Jack Jenkins, September of 2023, and then surprised a lot of people with a split decision victory over Morgan Charrier, April of this year at Fight Night. Allen versus Curtis, two outstriking him, 71 to 49, two takedowns to one for Morgan. But that, I mean, to take out a dog like Trevor Peak, and then guys, you know, Jack Jenkins is a guy that has had, you know some amount of attention on you know we we thought that jack jenkins was capable of good things in the ufc and and now waiting for that to load right now but chepe it's hard to believe that he's 16 and 6 as a pro because you've looked fantastic in the ufc um you know and has done well in dfs score now jack jenkins winner of three of his four fights in the ufc and has only lost it to chepe so and then to take out a dude like a Hot prospect in Morgan Charrier. That was a big one. Uh, it, and it shocked a lot of people. And it, But it shows us, like, who Chepe is. Like, this is a very dangerous fighter. And against, you know, to, to do what you did against those three guys, all presenting very unique challenges, is very impressive. So, Damon Jackson. Yeah, you know, I think... Chepe might just be a little too dynamic and well-rounded for him. You know, like, this is... You know, Damon Jackson can do well against, like, a low to moderately low level of competition. The Sabatinis and the Argettas, guys that are, you know, good enough to get wins, you know, every once in a while and hang around. 
It was a nice win against Alexander Hernandez that he could have ended up losing. Um, you know, we've only seen Damon Jackson lose to, you know, good fighters over the, you know, the last however many years. But this is one where I'm going to have to go against that, um, you know, what my usual sentiment might be there as far as, you know, octagon experience and the quality of the opponents that you fought and that you've lost to. Because I do think there is a ceiling to who Damon Jackson can beat. And he's an exciting guy. He, he steps up to the plate. So he ends up in some bigger fights, like against Billy Q and Ige. Uh, you know, those were nice spots. And he's a great guy to put on a fight night card. And you know that it's going to be a, an exciting fight. But Chepe can make an exciting fight. And he can win it too. That's the most important part here. And Alexander Hernandez, that's a good signature win. But I think that might be Damon Jackson's ceiling. And I think Chepe's ceiling is higher than Alexander Hernandez. And I think he's in, in I think he's gonna show that on Saturday. Chepe minus two ten. Um start off at minus two forty five, hasn't moved a whole lot. Chepe by decision. That's plus two hundred. Chepe by knockout is plus 250, or plus 205. So maybe, I, I I think those are about split pretty even. You know, I think Chepe can knock out Damon Jackson in a bloody, you know, fight. I think he can do it in any round. I, I think maybe, you know, it, it might take a little bit more damage to accumulate. Um, but Chepe by TKO knockout plus 205. I think that he's going to be worthwhile to pay for in DFS. I don't think Damon Jackson will be cheap enough for me to want to go with him this week. But again, who the hell knows this week with the limited options that we have? I think Chepe wins this fight like 75 to 80 times out of 100. And now we are to the main event of the evening. Break out the red panties. We got a highly questionable fight. A heavyweight main event. A heavyweight main event rematch between Marcin Tybura and Sergey Spivak. Currently ranked um, number eight and number nine in the world, respectively. Right behind Jelton, Stipe, Curtis Blades, Sergey Pavlovich. That's how it goes. And right in front of Ty Tuivasa, Derek Lewis, Jorzina Rosenstruck. Um, I do like that Romanov, Marcus Rogier de Lima, and Nascimento round out the top 15. Um, anyway, this fight happened, what, right as Sergei Spivak was coming into the UFC. It was, it was his third fight in the UFC. And he's been a, a real active heavyweight since then. Just hasn't fought this year. But Sergei Spivak is the minus 162 favorite. Ty Burr, the plus 136 underdog. And again, that's where we're at in the heavyweight division is that this rematch is happening as the main event of a UFC fight card, which is fine. I don't, uh, I, you know, I do not really complain about quality of cards with quotations or whatever the main event is. I'm here for UFC level fights just like I am for PFL and Bellator and One and Ryzen and LFA and all that other stuff, um, you know, any given week. But, you know, this rematch, it's like, can you really, like, we can't move the division along anywhere. Number eight, number nine, this might just flip their number. So it not only does it feel like repetitive and like it's not what people necessarily wanted for either of these two, it feels kind of inconsequential. It just feels important for Sergey Spivak, you know, because Marcin Tibera has, you know, we've seen his ceiling. And, you know, being the older guy born in 1985, going to be turning 40 next year. That guy's not going to be competing for a championship, especially with the the pace at which this heavyweight division is moving along. But Sergey Spivak, who knows, still born in 1995. um, Since coming into the UFC in 2019, that is one, two, four, seven, eleven fights, and it's it, it like ramped up quickly. You know, so Spivak lost two of his first three in the UFC. To Walt Harris and Marcin Tybura. Both guys that ended up, you know, in the ranking picture at different times. And he had a win over Tai Tuivasa by second round arm triangle in between that. That's back, you know, five years ago. 
Now he has won six of his last eight fights over Carlos Felipe, Jared Vandera, Alexei Olenek. Now it gets more impressive. Greg Hardy, a first-round knockout, a second-round knockout over Augusto Sakai, and a first-round arm triangle that you'll remember you heard on this very show the prediction that Sergey Spivak would beat Derek Lewis by arm triangle after six raggedy and doll takedowns that he that he threw on him in the first round. Sergey Spivak's four losses in the UFC, Harris, Tybura, and then the last two, the ones that have happened in the last three years, Tom Aspinall and Cyril Gaon. Now, he got dominated by Cyril Gaon. Outstruck 109 to 11. Zero takedowns, finished in the second round. But you, you have to admit, whatever you think about the polar bear, all right, he's only lost to guys that have either been ranked or have been interim champions from the beginning. And, and you know, back five years ago, um, when it was 2019, he was, what, 24? So, and, and taking on Walt Harris and Marcin Chibera. And the name, you know, beating Lewis and Sakai, and Hardy, and Olenek, and tied to Ivasa. You know, his skill set has proven too much for those guys that are a little bit more one-dimensional and need to hit you with something big. You know, that's a, uh, that is a hard prescription against Sergey Spivak, where he has versatile MMA skills. He's a big dude with a big head and big shoulders. And, you know, he's, if, if he's able to throw you around, he can do some slick stuff. He's always looking for the finish, really, and that's something that people like about him. Um, and he's come up with a lot of impressive wins. Ty Burra. This guy's been in the UFC since April of 2016. Has fought a ton of people. I mean, it, let's say I'll sit here and, and count how many fights he's had in the UFC. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 fights in the UFC. Wins over Andre Arvlosky, Stefan Struve, Spivak, Maxim Grishin, sure. Ben Rothwell, Greg Hardy, Walt Harris, Alexander Romanov, Blagoy Ivanov, and tied to Ivasa. Losses in his career to Fabricio Verdum, Timothy Johnson, Shamila Durakimov, Augusto Sakai, interestingly enough, Alexander Volkov, and Tom Aspinall. I mean, naturally, there's a lot of similarity in these two guys' resumes. There's only, you know, so much variation that there can be in heavyweight when we got guys that have been fighting in the UFC since the year 2000 that are still around. Um, but he's the winner of three of his last four fights. That dates back to August of 2022. Two decision wins over Alexander Romanov and Blagoy Ivanov, outstriking them 47-40 to 40 and 40-34. to 34. He got taken down twice by Romanov, still ended up with the majority decision. Uh, and the scoring for that one, what, 29-28, there was one draw on that card where I think Romanov got a 10-8 in the first round, but it, it, on one judge's scorecard. So that's why it was a majority decision. Tybura is just, you know, skill set, he doesn't need to land more than 40 strikes. He can land, you know, upwards of 50, 70, 90 strikes in a fight if that's what you force out of him. But he's not going to force anything that he doesn't have to do. You know, the fight can kind of come to Marcin. He's well-rounded enough. He's patient. Um, he got a rear naked choke the last time out against Tai Tuivasa. I don't like the odds of that happening again ever for him. But I don't know. I mean, that's a tough one to call. Like, normally on the underdog side, I would usually say, like, yeah, Marcin Tiber can absolutely win this fight. Um, he's beaten him before, Sure. And Marcin Tiber is just the kind of guy that up to a certain level can, you know, beat anybody and eke out close decisions, keeping it keeping it close, slowing the pace down, getting a takedown if you need to, but limiting the opponent's takedowns too, you know? He doesn't get taken down a whole lot. Um, so, but Marcin Tiber almost being 40 years old, I mean, I will give it, but two of those last three wins, tied to Ivasa and Blagoy Ivanov. I am a little bit more impressed with what Sergey Spivak has been up to since March of 2022. Uh, surviving onslaughts from people that were going to try to put him to sleep. That's not what Tybura is going to be doing. But Sergey Spivak has moved past the point where he's losing to the Walt Harris's and the Tyburas. He's at the point now where the guys that he can't beat are the Aspinalls and the Gons. 
you know, so we've seen Sergey Spivak, I think, grow tremendously since he's been in the UFC. I think that his skills are just going to be that much more explosive. You know, it, it could end up being a close decision. It certainly could. And I don't know how comfortable I am going, like, Spivak by knockout or by submission. But, like, Sergey Spivak by decision in similar fashion, maybe even, like, flip-flop with how, like, the statistics ended up in their first fight or similar to how his fight with Carlos Felipe went. You know, Tiber is a very competent fighter. He absolutely has a chance in this. Normally, that would make me say that I love a guy at plus 136, but I think, you know, Sergey Spivak's on his way up still. And, and Tibera, you know, on a steady decline, and he's kept, you know, going for longer than people would expect him to for sure. But I think Sergey Spivak wins this fight like, Probably wins this fight like 65 times out of 100 right now. Maybe 60. Minus 162, I think, you know, that's fair enough. It's not what I'm going to be going with as a money line play. I prefer Tybura as a money line play. It's just how I'm judging those numbers and, and the values that they have. Spivak by decision, that's plus 350. Tybura by decision, plus 350. And you're going Tybura, you're going Tybura by decision. Spivak inside the distance plus 138. I think that that's about split value with Spivak by decision. Um, because eventually you got to account for the fact that Marcin Tybura is older in the octagon than he has ever been before. But DFS-wise, I think both these guys could be played. I know they're probably sitting in like the low 8,000 range right now. So I think that that is more than viable on a week like this. So I have to, you know, like, I have to lean towards like who's going to win this Probably is Sergey Spivak, despite the result of the first fight four years ago. Spivak is a much different fighter, and, you know, Tibera is four years older uh, and on the wrong side of 35 of that. But, you know, what does the result of that fight mean? I have no idea. And and that's kind of a problem with the main event. If, the, if that is a problem with the main event, that is one issue that I do take is, you know, what exactly is the point of this fight? Does this move anything along in the division? Is this for entertainment purposes? It doesn't really seem to satisfy, satisfy either of those two criteria. It doesn't mean that it won't be an exciting fight or a fun fight to watch. But, you know, you, you just got to wonder that was there no better matchup to make it heavyweight or was this just the best that they could do given the circumstances? Anyway, folks, that is it for episode 146 of Roto Ballers official MMA podcast. Tap that. Again, follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. That's where I make picks for all major and regional and UFC Fight Pass MMA events and boxing matches. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Follow the podcast. Like, subscribe, comment, leave favorable reviews. Tell your friends at Tap that MMA podcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Spotify. Come out to the Roto Baller MMA Discord on Saturday. Let's talk about UFC Vegas 95. Check out my interlude episodes that should be coming out here in the next couple of weeks with folks from the world of professional football and mixed martial arts. Check out my weekly MMA DFS value picks article coming out on Fridays now. Folks, thank you so much for listening. Have yourselves a good week. Don't get starved from the lack of MMA action going on. Get it where you can. And look forward to the pickup next week and the start of the de- uh, of the contender series. Back on. Have a great week, folks. Peace.